no canister breaches permitted, um, regardless of the consequence to the public. And so those metrics uh, need to be thought out very well, and uh, I think we, we will come to the right conclusion. Thank you for your time. All right, we Matt, need to go uh, ahead. Matt, I just, I thought I, he said it was going to be the last question. You hand me the mic. Uh, quickly, uh, you mentioned uh, North, this is Donna Gilmore with Santa Ana for Safety. Sure. Uh, you mentioned North Anna had a, um, a, a crack from the, the the concrete was there were some marginal changes to the concrete okay. configuration. So the what uh, my question is, um, the, given that there will be you know some cracking there, some cracking uh, in the possibly in the um, uh, the thin uh, steel canisters, uh, how 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 where does the seismic evaluation come in? Because my understanding is the seismic uh, uh, evaluations for um, for you know, proving licenses, it, it assumes perfect materials. So now we're dealing with aging, where we can have concrete degradation and maybe some degradation in the canisters. How how does that fit in the seismic evaluation issue? Fit in what you're doing? Okay, so that's a, that's a good question. Let me uh, let me make sure I make it clear though that I didn't say that the canisters are cracked or are cracking. I no, I understand that, but it is a, is a Real possibility. You can't exclude that possibility with aging management, or are you excluding that possibility? No, I don't think we're going to exclude the potential for the loads being placed on even a potentially degraded system, even though we're even though we begin to do the aging management programs and doing the inspections to ensure those kinds of degradation mechanisms are not active. But without, uh, I think we can easily say the what if scenarios and hypothesize. Uh, we do that, um, you know, the NRC does do that. And I said, what, you know, what would be, what is the largest um, loss of material possible and still maintain its all safety functions? And we can look at that and do that analysis. But that does not mean by any stretch that uh, we would permit that kind of degradation to occur. So, yes, we can do those types of analyses. And uh, um, that, that will probably be... Not that difficult to do, actually. So is that going to be in your scope, then, of what you're talking about for public comment? Uh, I cannot say for certain at this time, but I uh, would not uh, put it outside the realm of what we would do as part of okay. our program. Thank you. Uh, Donna Gilmore. Um, the question is, um, when you were talking about uh, canned fuel, was uh, that was one of your defense in depth, as you were referring to? It's not defense in depth. It's actually an approach you can take. If you already start by putting the fuel in a damaged fuel can, then it kind of it helps simplify in that all you have to do is just perform that the all you have to do is just perform a structural analysis that shows that the integrity or that the can will uh, can demonstrate some form of structural integrity, and then you just do other safety analyses. So you so you see how the can affects the other technical disciplines, and just do your normal analysis that you would just but just with the can for the other disciplines. Okay. Yes, because I I know the the cans are un, unsealed. Um, so they don't provide a radiation barrier, even though they're in cans. Um, so if a canister was to crack all the way through and you lose that defense in depth, what is the second, what is, what is the second, what is the defense in depth if a, if a canister was to crack all the way through? Because it's not the cans. Mark, do you want to address that one? Sure, I'd be happy to. So... The, when you look at the aging management programs, there, there is a defense in depth, a broad scope of defense in depth, and the aging management program is a defense in depth to a canister cracking all the way through wall. But even if that would occur, and we believe that's low probability, especially based on the way we're implementing aging management programs for dry cast storage systems, there are other defense in depth. The site area radiation monitors is, is another defense in depth that you would apply to that. How would a radiation monitor be a defense in depth? Because it's, uh, I didn't mean to say death, uh, defense in depth um, 
because that's really too late. I mean, if your monitor, your radiation monitor is picking it up, you've already breached uh, your, your defense. There are, are different, again, levels of defense in depth that go all the way to protecting public health and safety and area radiation monitors. And at the worst case, if a breach were to occur, then you would implement an emergency plan and maybe have evacuation of folks in the worst case. But again, we believe it's extremely low probability that a canister would breach in any case. Okay, and it looks like Bob, Bob has, has a follow-up to that. Rod, I have a, a quick question. You mentioned that technology exists to handle fuel with gross ruptures or structural defects. Does this, is this technology actually usable today, or is it something in the planning stage? No, we, we, we have that. I mean, we have, uh, there is damaged fuel, and, uh, in, in, you know, Bob alluded to where the industry is now. Um, the, the industry wasn't always there. Uh, we, we've had special tools for handling damaged fuel. We, there are hot cells in the world. There, um, you know, there's, there's a facility and reprocessing facilities actually cut fuel up in hot cells and, and they know how to handle that and how to, you know, process everything that comes out of, of doing that. Um, it, it's, it exists, it's implemented. Um, and I think if you look at, at, at the designs of DOE's Yucca Mountain repository, uh, they, they included design features that could, could have handled uh, damaged fuel if they had to, had to package any of that. So it, It's my understanding that the, the TAN hot cell facility was closed and there are no hot uh, cell facilities in the United States that can be transferred these uh, fuel from these large canisters we have from one to another, and there are no uh, mobile facilities that exist in the U U.S. The ones in France are smaller, and it's unclear, uncertain, if the mobile facilities could even be built to the sizing that we're talking about. I Thank think you. this is a little bit off topic. Okay, if well, he was saying that there was technology that existed, so I was wanted to know what that was. Yeah, no, I understand, but since we need to keep going, if you That's can follow all. up was, after. Yeah. Well, Thank just you. real quick, so it doesn't appear there's not an answer. I think the, the first thing you might do if you had damaged fuel in an area where you did not have a hot cell, and there are smaller scale hot cells, um, would be to, to move to a transportation overpack to give yourself an additional level of, of confinement. So, so that exists today. There are transportation overpacks, uh, but I won't go into a lot more detailed answer. Uh, I, I just to say that we can handle it. All right, thank you. Let's say thank you. Hi, right, Donna Gilmore again. Hi. If I'm understanding this uh, correctly, you're looking to not do a license amendment for the things that you're currently required to do license amendments for? Is that the... Um. <clears throat> There are requests that have been submitted either by um, an error that there was uh, somehow a typo. For, for example, it's a typo um, in the existing amendment. So, and those are very minor. So, there, there need to be a better way in terms of trying to make those changes without having to go through a full length of amendment. Yeah I, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Is I think as long as that's scoped extremely narrow, narrow and clearly defined, uh, but to, we, we, we've been through a situation with San Onofre where because they didn't get a license amendment for their steam generator uh, a project, um, that we ended up with ratepayers stuck with billions of dollars and no energy from that plant. So in, in San Onofre, in Southern California, we're a little goosey when uh, skipping the NRC license amendment process. So and in your performance metrics, you were measuring the time saved, but there was no perf the metric there about, you know, was, did it result in any safety? But I'm assuming it probably didn't, but 
just as an observation. I really appreciate the current process with the RAIs. I find that extremely valuable, and we have been able to find things that the you know the NRC was getting ready to prove. So, as speaking as a, a stakeholder that lives uh, in in San Clemente, uh, two miles from a nuclear reactor, um, I I prefer a little overkill rather than underkill, or maybe I should say that the other way around. But uh, anyway, so uh, thank you. Okay, it, thank you, Donna. Jennifer, if I, oh, if ahead, I could Brock. just kind of add to what Donna said. We in the industry, and we've expressed this in, in public meetings, are, are also concerned that the scope of that correction process be as narrow as possible. We. Our view is, if there if there is an impediment in the process, don't don't try to work around the process. Fix the process, which again goes back to the petition. But uh, yeah, we, we appreciate keeping that narrow. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, okay, I just Christian. Want to clarify. Yeah, my name is Christian Aragwas. I'm one of the branch chiefs in Division of Spent Fuel Management. And Donna, just to answer your question, it, it really isn't circumventing the the license amendment process. Actually. It goes through the same level of review. It goes through it goes through our technical disciplines. The intent of the process was, at least for the industry, there isn't something that allows them to come in to make uh, to address either facts you know, un, or incorrect uh, statements in their uh, SAR. So it's really for us to go ahead and to issue a a revision so that it's not a standalone amendment uh, that goes into our regulations. So. So just so you're not uh, concerned with what it goes through, it still goes through our level of review, still goes through rulemaking. It's after lunch, right? <laughs> okay, thanks, Daryl. And I, I want to say, uh, uh, Daryl has really educated me. On, I've listened to his uh, July and August presentations on uh, stress crows and cracking, and it was uh, extremely educational. And I have a lot of respect for his work, and I thank Al for bringing him on board. And you, you know, you guys have been uh, um, very helpful to me. So I want to. Thank you, and uh, thank for Mar Mark for letting them do their thing. Okay. Um, now, on this, uh, uh, you, you mentioned something about using operating experience as a possible aging. That wouldn't apply to stress crows and cracking, would it? You wouldn't use operating experience for that, would you? Okay, so the operating experience that we have right now for stress corrosion cracking, and you're talking about stress corrosion cracking of stainless steel canisters in this right, case, right, spent fuel canisters. You're interested in. There is operating experience for operating reactors, components right. in operating reactors. Right. Uh, as we go forward in 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 looking at and implementing aging management programs that will sp specifically be looking at the aging and degradation of stainless steel canisters we will collect that operating experience and that operating experience we expect will fully be utilized uh, to make necessary changes uh, to uh, licensees aging management programs. Okay. All right. So it would be one of the things you take into consideration. Now kind of uh, stepping back um, I know you license these things uh, for 20 years, but it would seem to me, given the NRC decision for continued storage, that it may be time to rethink that. It, it, I, I agree with the 20-year licenses. I think that's good. Um, but it seems when you give the 20-year licenses, you should be saying that you certify this will work for extended storage, whether that be 50 years, 80 years, 60 years, whatever. It, but you still like check in every 20 years to relicense. But when you do your safety analysis report, you say, yes, we, based on the engineering, you know, all the, the data, um, we certify that this will be good for, you know, however long you want it to last. If that's 60 years, whatever, before it needs to be replaced. It seems like you should be certifying it for, for that because we're sure in the heck not going to take it out after another 20 years that we don't have to. So, it, but I, so are you understanding what I'm saying? 
where you certify it for a longer term and, and that, okay, I'll give you a 20-year license if you can certify that it's going to hold up for 60 years or 80 years. And then we'll talk to you another 20 years and kind of reevaluate this. It's a different way of looking at it, considering we're in a new world now. Okay, so for renewals, because that's what we're talking about here, renewals are, are, can be up to a period of 40 years. Correct. I just want to clarify that. Right, right. Okay, and, and uh, we're not waiting for 20 years to, for licensees to go take another look at it. Uh, depending on the nature of the aging management program, they may be looking, uh, implementing those aging management programs much more frequently than every 20 years. Okay, so the, the, the uh, experience that gets gained and, and, and what they do uh, to make sure that these systems are in fact functioning correctly and, and evaluating the need for corrective actions would, would occur, most cases, much more frequently than 20 years. Yeah, I don't, th I don't think you're under understanding my question. It isn't about what your aging management plan is. Is it When you do your safety evaluation report, the NRC only certifies it for whatever those years are, either 20 or 40. So you're only saying, we trust this thing's going to be good for 20 years, or we trust this thing's going to be good for 40 years. I would like to see you say, we trust this thing's going to be good for 80 years or 60 years or however long you think we should be able to keep it in these containers before we have to change them out, but still only issue a 20-year license so you can reevaluate your decision based on maybe some aging It's management. a different perspective. In different, terms of different, a totally different, different, different perspective because yeah, we are in a saying. new world. We are in, this stuff may sit here for decades, centuries, and, we don't know. And so, I, I, it's a good, it's a good, good thought. Uh, let me take that. You I'm, know. I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, to me that, you know, but. Let me, let me yeah. just say that, you know, with proper aging management, Okay, this is not just for nuclear, nuclear casks or nuclear reactors. We're talking about ships. We're talking about planes. We're talking about bridges. Okay, there's active aging management going, going for everything that's out there. Okay, um, ski lifts. Okay, things like that. All right. What we're doing is we're just taking those concepts of how we prolong or how we keep things from getting to a place where we feel it's unsafe. Okay, and so the aging management programs that we have outlined here are creating a bar which we will not accept to go below. Okay? No, I, I agree, and, and, and the aging management should, should show that these things are maintainable so you don't have to replace them. And it's a, it's a good yeah, thing. Yeah, but I want it to be maintainable for more than the 20 years you're certifying it for. And if, I don't see I may, that being addressed. If I may make a point, when we first embarked on this, just task a, a, about a year ago, a little over a year ago now, we wanted to build a regulatory framework that was sustainable, not only predictable and flexible with the learning agent management programs, but is sustainable. So we knew, well, we had a high, a high probability at the time, and the same as today, that these spent fuel storage systems would be in service for a long period of time, whether that's- What's a long period mean? Well, it, it, we don't know. Well, you got, well, we don't know. When you said the word long period, well, how many years were you thinking? Well, within the regulatory framework, because we have to have a, a, a big touchstone on, in certain regular periods, it's 40 years now for renewal. So the next renewal for Calvert Cliffs would be 40 years from now. We wanted to make sure that whatever framework we put into place was sustainable. This learning agent manager program will react to those, those different things that come up. And, and I'm sure that Brian will talk about toll gates. There's toll gates that are set every five years or so on certain frequency. There's toll gates that are set on a specific frequency. Some are five years, some are others. And then there's pop-up toll gates. If you have operating experience that shows there is a potential issue that could affect systems like yours, then you have a pop-up toll gate that you have to stop and say, okay, I have to evaluate this information, determine if I have to make any changes in my system. But I understand what you're saying. It really is a, a system, a framework that is sustainable for forever, really, because it's learning and reactive and proactive going forward. But we have to stay within those license periods that we have in the regulations. And, you know, we might look so at that. Are you saying that you don't have confidence that you could certify it longer than 20 or 40 years at this point based on the data you have? I say today that I'm stuck with the renewal periods that, I, that are in the regulations, but that could change. But I'm also saying that I'm very confident that this aging manager program that we set up is sustainable for an extended and indefinite period of time. Oh, I wish I could share your confidence, but That's if true. I could see the data to support that, sure. that but would it, be great. The data, is, the data is not the data is not necessarily just the data we have in hand today. It's again, learning aging manager program, proactive, reactive, that if new stuff comes up, then it has to be dealt with. It has to be evaluated, assessed, and determined if corrective action is necessary. 
Thank you. Okay. And I'm open for questions on slide 15. Any questions? All right, Donna. You might as well just leave that microphone up there. Hi. Uh, this is Donna Gilmore. Um, you referred to slow aging. The aging is slow. I, I don't know if we have enough data to know that for sure, since there's no, as Al said to me one time, if anybody knew when stress corrosion cracking initiation would occur, they'd probably win a Nobel Prize, uh, which I thought was interesting. And then given the Diablo Canyon um, canister where they found salts and they found temperatures low enough and all the other conditions that uh, Daryl has mentioned in his previous presentations, uh, that it has, the, you know, it appears it has the conditions for stress crows and cracking, which was a big surprise because I recall from the meetings you thought it would take, and from the summary of the August uh, 5th uh, meeting, that the assumption was cracking wouldn't initiate for at least 30 years because the temperature would be ab above 85 degree centigrade, which is, you know, where the, the, uh, Cracking could occur with the with the salts and, the, and that type of thing. So, so I'm taking issue with the aging slow, and then identifying um, that you said you could identify degradation well in advance. Well, as of today, in spent fuel containers, not other stainless steel components and other stainless steel products, but in containers filled with nuclear waste. Um, uh, my understanding from the presentations I listened to at the NRC and other research I've done is you do not currently have technology to inspect for stress corrosion cracking or even, you know, a lot of, of corrosion, let alone knowing how quick the crack could go through the container. And from, from other research I've done, it, it, it appears that in containers that are at the higher end of the range, say, this, you know, the 60 to 85 degrees centigrade, the cracks can actually go through four times faster than ambient temperature containers, which, has, which have failed in as little as 17 years. Um, and then you mentioned in your slide that you, you have plans made to empty systems. I would be interested in, in knowing what those plans are because there are no hot cells, and the plan for decommissioned plants is to destroy the spent fuel pools, which, as far as I know, are the only way that you could actually even begin to uh, reload fuel in another container. Uh, as far as the toll gate, my understanding of toll gate, to put it simply, is um, that the toll gate means the industry gets to decide when to inspect rather than the NRC. And I, uh, you know, and I, th I think it's great for the industry to decide when to inspect, but I also think the NRC should also have requirements as to when they think should inspection should happen. It, it's, sorry about that. Oh, can't we? And then I think the, and then on this AMP all proprietary, as someone that, that it is just a few miles from a nuclear plant with tons of cesium right by the ocean in canisters that cannot be inspected um, uh, to make all of all of the ways you plan to do this proprietary is is not what I would call transparent I, it seems like a big cop out and a, and a danger to the public that we should have the right to know what plans you have to protect us from an accident so I think it's outrageous that it, you call it a proprietary. Uh, you have got MP197, the transportation cast approved, which was a big surprise to a lot of us. And when I looked at the technical specs uh, for the MP197, the entire section of how you justify transporting high burn up fuel was marked proprietary. We didn't even get two words uh, of information. And yet the NRC has new reg um, uh, uh, not new reg, um, the, your inform information guidance 11 
where you have a policy that you do not transport high burn up fuel at this time because of the issues and to leave that as it stands and then make an entire proprietary section and approve MP197 transportation canisters. It, it just seems outrageous to me. So I, that's all I have. Okay. Uh, I guess in saying the aging occurs slowly enough that we will detect it, I, I should have said uh, our proprietary proposed frequencies uh, will be reviewed by the NRC and uh, uh, either found acceptable or not to detect aging in a timely fashion in time to, if need be, actually unload a system. Our operating procedures and our safety analysis report uh, account for loading and also for unloading. I frankly don't have a response to the unloading at a site that doesn't have a spent fuel pool. I will fail open on, on that item. Um, toll gates. Brian's going to talk toll gates when he talks any I-1403. As I said, it's, it's a forced periodic pause and assessment of the overarching situation with uh, the aging at the particular site, the research projects, and uh, a documentation of uh, where things stand. That's my understanding. That's what we call for in our application. Um, the review will react to that, not trying to pass the buck to the NRC, uh, but that's the reality. Proprietary aspects in our business are all about business competition. The NRC obviously has full details, full access to all of our information, and they approve or, or uh, uh, ask questions and, and eventually approve, we hope. But we cannot reveal certain things, and our competitors cannot reveal certain things, and the Office of General Counsel weighs in on whether or not they agree with our uh, um, thoughts on what is proprietary and not. We don't mean to hold anything from the general public, but we do mean to hold things from the our competitors, and they do the same in return. One other um, thing is right now with the technology, with the, the thin welded canisters, uh, with that with that technology, um, we we have no early warning system. We will not know. We won't. For example, by the bolted canisters, you can get an indirect warning of a helium leak. So right now, today, the only way we'll know these canisters are failing is if they leak radiation into the environment. Um, uh, the requirement, as I understand it, is somebody only has to walk around every three or four months to see if there's radiation leaking out of the canisters. Um, and so that that's a pretty poor early warning system that we're living with. Yeah, uh, today. Donna, let me let me let me talk to that. Okay, a couple things. One, the slowness of of this degradation. Okay, we're looking at degradation generically. Okay, we're looking at stress corrosion cracking, in particular chloride stress corrosion cracking specifically, because right. we know that we've had operational experience on the reactor side. We've gone at this right from the beginning, okay? We've been dealing with it. We've been doing work, research. Daryl here did research on it for a number of years for us, okay? It's been an issue going on for probably more than 10 years, okay? We feel, and through the research and through EPRI's uh, recent report on flaw growth uh, characteristics, okay, there's two pieces. There's initiation, which there's uncertainty. When it can when it occur, well, it's not gonna occur right away. Okay, it takes time for the conditions to get there. Now, you what, what about temperature the Diablo wise, situation? You, well, the temperature, okay, even at songs, you have canisters that are at a, a temperature right off the bat that can get to, you know, seven kilowatts. So that's a low enough temperature to start, okay? But it takes time for the environment to get there. We are aware of that, okay? But even if you take away the initiation part, there's the growth part. Right. The growth part from the EPRI report for a 5 8 inch thick stainless steel at specifically at the um, Camp Pendleton site, which is where San Onofre is, has a through wall crack growth time. Okay, they've calculated for that thickness of canister is 86 years before it goes through wall. Okay, we're talking 28 years to go halfway through wall. Okay, 
we will have, you know, what we are saying in terms of our inspect, and that's, that's on the low, that's the, that's, that's the most conservative number, okay? We're looking at over 100 years, okay, if you go to a higher temperatures, just 20, 25 more degrees, okay? Now, knowing that, what we have put out there in terms of what is the guidance that, that we're putting out there, and Daryl can talk to this a little bit more if, if he wants, is we're requiring inspections and inspections five years after they go in because only for the first plant, Calvert, they have said they can come in in three years. So they are gonna be able to inspect within three years of October to see whether or not they have cracking. And the cracking, we don't want to have a leak. So you're saying the bolted canisters can, can you know, you'll, you'll have some sort of leak detection. We don't wanna have a leak. We wanna catch the, if there is cracks, because we don't, we, it's, a propo, it's a potential mechanism. If there are cracks, we will catch it well before it goes through wall and remediate so there is no leak, okay? That's our, that's our plan, okay? That's what we have put out there. Industry has not you know, proposed that to us. We have put it out there. Okay. Right, but it doesn't exist today, and, it, and there, there's a UK um, study. There are inspections out there today. There not, have been three. For, you said Diablo was one. Well, no, they just, they just inspected to see if it had condition for cracks. Where they no, they also looked at the surface, and we are saying that we're even going a step further in terms of inspection, okay? We're not looking for cracks. We're looking for the precursors right. to cracks. Right. So we're even looking at even more conservative than just looking for the cracks. Right. Okay. So being able to see that, yes, you know, you know, they looked at the surface. Okay. Whether or not they can see that the detection of those precursors, we're, you know, we're we're getting down to that. Okay. We're getting down to that level of detail with the various licensees and the the COC holders to get to that level of detail, so that we are confident that in three years' time they will see and be able to see it before it ever goes into a condition where you have a through wall crack. Well, ba you know, based on uh, the fact that the canisters have to stay inside the concrete overpacks, and you have a limited area to to do this, I, I see the challenges. And, and there was a UK study that was talking about three alternative ways to check for uh, stress corrosion cracking. And even in, even if you had full access to the outside, it, it's still challenging to know you have it. They recommended the best way was to be able to put a fluid inside of it, which obviously we can't do. So, so I'm not as confident that whatever they come up with is 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 tech tech going to be tech. We'll we'll technology. have public meetings on. I, yeah. You know, so I'm, I mean, I'll, you know, so you I know. you know, when it's there, call me. You know. Okay. Yes. It, and we, it's we, not there. And then there's the 87 year thing. You know, when I look at we'll there, check that there, too. When I look at Daryl's data and when I r read other material engineers' calculations, they do not match up with EPRI. So I don't know what EPRI based their calculations on. It was on that August meeting that you attended on the phone? Yeah, I, mean, I think you discussion. guys found some problems with some of their numbers there. Oh, we did. There, but we did. And, yeah. they, and, they, and they fixed them based on, on that meeting. Yeah, but I, that meeting you know, I'm not, I just don't, I just am not. I'm not seeing data. I'm seeing a lot of calculations. Yes. I, I just wanted numbers. to get that information yeah. out there, but yeah. we do have to move on because we're, okay. we're 15 yeah. minutes behind schedule okay. right now. So, all right, the next presentation, and Donna, we can talk about it right after this if you want, okay? Um, all right, uh, let's go ahead and uh, questions. Here in the audience. I'm Diane Dorigo with Nuclear Information and Resource Service. I had a question from the last session. To <laughs> is the new reg? Uh, I'm I'm sorry. The um, the uh, NEI uh, 1403 is that publicly available? Yes, yes, it is. It, um, and the atoms, or it is an atoms. I can get you the ML number. Okay. Uh, I can. Yeah. And then on uh, for for Keith um, regarding it's the waste confidence. Um, no. How how um, how does the NRC think that recontainer, which is still an assumption, that after every hundred years that the dry casks would be recontainerized if necessary? Um, how is that funded? That would be fun, funded through, I mean, all, all power plants are required to have funds that, to decommission their facilities as well as to maintain the existing facilities. So if there's a, 
a power plant that that um, uh, shrinks its license down after it's been, de been decommissioned to an independent spent fuel storage installation on site. They're required to maintain the funds that are uh, necessary to maintain that facility as well as eventually decommission that facility if a repository becomes available. But if, if the number of times that needs to happen is uncertain, how do you make a requirement in the decommissioning fund to cover it? Well, th these are iterative analyses that are done by the licensees submit annually, and Charlie Honey, I think, wants to respond to. Uh, the, so the, the licensees are, are required to provide information annually, annually, and the staff reviews that annually in terms of the adequacy of funding for these activities. So is there anywhere that we could see an example of what the estimated costs would be for recontainerizing, say, after the first 100 years at a, a standard uh, sample facility? So, I mean, is the question, are you, do you want to know what the cost of, of building a dry transfer facility would be? That and actually implementing it and having new containers? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that I have that information. I mean, it, there were reports done um, um, maybe a decade or so ago in terms of developing a dry transfer facility, but I don't know if the cost information was included in that information. So I, I'd, I'd have to look back at that and get, get back with you on that. But isn't the decision that the NRC has confidence that the waste will be taken care of based on the assumption that this will happen? Yeah. Yes, the answer to that is yes, but, but the anticipation for the need for a dry transfer facility is uh, many years out into the future, and therefore, again, as these annual reviews go through the process, if that becomes an eventuality, then the, the licensees would have to provide the funding for that in these annual submittals to the NRC, and it would have to be reviewed and evaluated by the staff. Are they still licensees when you're down to just dry storage? Yes. Yet yeah, Part 50 licenses remain. And Diane, is it Diane, right? Uh, I got the ML for you. Do you want it? Yes, I do. Sure. It's uh, the report for 1403 is ML 14266 A Alpha 225. And the letter that is associated with the report is ML 14266 A is an Alpha 226. Hi, this is Donna Gilmore. I'd like to follow up on Diane's question. Uh, given the, the NRC decision for continued storage, isn't it time to reevaluate? Am I speaking okay? Uh, isn't it time to reevaluate what we expect the licensees to provide? In turn, I mean, we have ratepayers paying into a decommissioning fund with the assumption that we weren't going to have to replace these canisters. We're not collecting money, uh, you know, uh, for replacing canisters. That's not, that's not even been a concept. So shouldn't the NRC take the lead on saying that the decommissioning fund should provide the, me the mechanism of how that nuclear plant is going to have the money for that future thing? Because you don't come up with the money, you know, all of a sudden. It has to be raised over years. So given the new decision by the NRC, they've added another burden to the ratepayers and to the utility companies. Um, and so I would think the NRC would would change what they require and make sure they they have a, a plan for having adequate money for that replacement. And you can't say for sure it's 100 years, so I think that's pretty optimistic. It should be conservative, as should be all decisions. So that's my... Well, there are two different, uh, two different sources of funding. One is to to operate the facility, and that would be the money that's required to operate the independent fence fuel storage installation, as well as any ancillary facilities that have to be addressed, to be used to address any safety issues. That would be a separate set of, uh, uh, set of monies from the decommissioning funds that would be used to decommission the facility. 
Uh, and both of those things are looked at by the NRC staff and a determination is made of whether they're adequate or not at that particular time. If there's an anticipated need, then the, the, uh, the licensee would have to come up with the funds to, to perform the necessary functions. Well, there is an anticipated need. You've already said that these will have to be replaced, so you need to start building money for that. So that should be part of the plan. Well, let me clarify. What, what the staff said in the generic environmental impact statement was that it anticipated that there would be a geologic repository available within the short-term time frame, which is 60 years beyond the operating life of a power reactor. Therefore, uh, there would be no need at that point for a dry transfer facility or, you know, uh, transferring. The but fuel. the decision allows for 60, 100, 300 indefinite. That's the actual decision that, that it could be any of those periods. Again, let me try again. What the generic environmental impact statement and the rule do is just define the environmental impacts if that occurs. It doesn't license those facilities. It doesn't authorize those facilities. Those are done separately in site-specific licensing action. What I'm referring to is the people that are going to be reviewing the decommissioning plan to make sure there's adequate funding. It's a new ball game. So whoever is doing, uh, might get too close to this. So. Yeah. So whoever is is in that set, wh whoever the section is here that's reviewing, for example, San and Ovaries, what is it, a PDSAR? Is that what it's called? PSDAR. Are they looking at that to make sure there's funds in there to replace the canisters, too? Because there's no other pot of money. You know, I mean, y y some of us think, well, don't tear down those domes. You know, wait till the fuel is going to be gone. We can use that. Maybe we can use that dome money if we need to replace canisters. I mean, or, or else the NRC really needs to make sure that there is a provision for how they're going to raise that money and have that money available. There is a, a requirement. Uh, I can't remember the specific number of it uh, that requires the licensees to identify how they intend to manage the spent fuel for the period of time they expect to have it on site. Yeah, I don't think it includes a plan for replacing canisters. If that becomes a need, then it would be in the Well, it is. You've already stated it is a need no, in the future. We haven't stated that it would be a need. We're saying that it could occur and what the impacts would be if that did occur. What we said in the environmental impact statement was that we expected that there would be a geologic repository available for the disposition of this spent fuel within 60 years. Well, then can, can you say that we will not need to replace the canisters? I can't say that with. Uh, okay. Well, with, then we need to provide some uh, some mechanism if for that having become, that money. If that if we becomes a need, the staff will review that. The licensees will have to provide the information, and staff will review it at that time. I'm getting circular talk here. Do you know what I'm saying now? Um, I I can see everyone's uh -huh. position here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I hear you. I, you know, we, we, you know th this. We, you know, Keith mentioned it. it you know, I, I hear what you're saying. That is a function for you know for something outside of this discussion. That's why I can't really, you know, I can't talk to it personally. But there's not going to be a place for the utility, even if it has a part fifty or whatever part license it has for a closed facility. There's not going to be, at that point, a place for them to go to ratepayers. And in the case of merchant plants right now, they can't go to ratepayers to get more money. So whatever amount of money there is has to be able to pay for whatever the potential needs are into the future. And so we're just shifting it here so that there's a, the, the people in the community are going to be stuck when the time comes. And we will take that back to, the, I, I don't see the right people here. And well, so we'll, there is yeah. a requirement that, in, that they identify the sources of income that, that are required for the storage of spent fuel um, for the period of time that's needed. I mean, maybe I, I don't want to leave people frustrated, but, and I'll be glad to try to talk to you afterwards if, that, if that's okay with you all. I don't want to provide a circular answer if that, it's, what you think I'm doing.